everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Crowley. I am uh, on the executive committee of the Vermont Sierra Club and along with Rob Kidd, who's here, and Jack Cushman, who's also here. We've been uh, launched for the, for the last month a series of these Wednesday night um, community conversations, and, and we're going to continue that for the indefinite future. And we've had some great shows uh, so far, and tonight is all about uh, well, Earth Day teaching the next generation. It happens that we are going to be focusing heavily on uh, energy and climate education. And we've got some great people with us tonight who have their um, hands into that in a big way and have for quite a while. Uh, Matt Henschen is uh, a teacher at Harwood Union High School, and he's going to uh, speak with us shortly. But I think we're going to start with. Um, uh, Kara Robichek and Mariah Kagi of the uh, Vermont Energy Education Program, uh, and they provide services for uh, for schools, for teachers, for students around Vermont, and and they do a fantastic job of that. Um, so here we are in in this era when uh, things are very different, and so we're going to see, you know, how that how that's playing out. So. Uh, uh, Kara, are we starting with you? Yes, indeed. Great. Well, Kara Robichek, great to have you here. It's great to be here. So I'm going to share my screen. So Hopefully. you're seeing our logo and our mission statement. So just a really quick, quick overview of VEEP and who we are. Um, Vermont Energy Education Program has been around for 40 years. So we're a homegrown uh, energy and climate education organization. We work in schools all around the state. Um, uh, here's a, some, some statistics about the schools that we've been in, but generally speaking, we have worked in about three quarters of Vermont schools. And we also started a New Hampshire program a couple of years ago. So we're also starting to expand and do a lot more in New Hampshire. This slide shows the greenhouse gas emissions by sector. This is an Energy Action Network slide. I'm guessing that many of you may have seen this before, but basically I just wanna make the point that when we're talking about energy education, it's super important in terms of dealing with the climate because Vermont's climate impacts largely come from the energy sector. So when we are in schools and we are trying to work with students and have them understand um, the, the whole energy picture from transportation, thermal and electric generation, that is where the vast majority of our climate emissions are. So we feel like it's really important that young people start to understand this and start to understand what they can do about the, the emissions from energy. So what do we do? Uh, in a normal year, we would spend a lot of time uh, going into classrooms and working with students from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. Our mode is to do lots and lots of hands-on science and engineering so that young people get the chance to practice um, learning from their own experience, um, being able to make claims from the evidence that they see. This is really important for them to understand what's going on with the energy and climate picture around the world. Now, obviously, in the era of COVID-19, we are not going into schools. Schools are closed um, and students are learning from home. So what we have done is we have turned around and taken our workshops and made them into home learning resource units. So we have those for uh, students of all ages from kindergarten through 12th grade. And just as an example, um, our home heat transfer lessons and activities uses the student's home as a, a, a space to learn. So the student takes the time to go around and figure out how their home is heated. They learn about how home, how heat transfers in a building. They get to build some models and try to keep heat into a, a structure. Um, and then they get to look around their home and try to figure out you know, is my own home airtight? Is it, what, is it have good insulation? So we're trying to help students to use their own home as an educational resource and, and a space to learn from. Another thing that we do normally is that we do a lot of teacher professional development. So we will bring teachers together and help them to learn more about how to do energy and climate education with their own students. 
uh, this is a really powerful model when we want to reach a lot of people really fast to work with the teachers rather than directly with the students. So again, what we are doing in that regard right now is that we have moved all of that online uh, and we are running some three week uh, professional development trainings for teachers where they get a chance to learn from one another and from us about different educational strategies they can use both in the classroom when they're back in the classroom and right now while they're um, stuck in an online environment with their students. So we have, we're, we're in the midst of one of those right now and we have a couple of more sections of those starting in May. And finally, the, the whole reason for all of this is that we would like to see students taking action. And so we do put together uh, posters that have a lot of data in them to get students thinking and start moving towards action. And I'm going to let Mariah tell you some stories about some of the work that we do directly with students on action projects. Yes, um, thank you. So, um, yeah, so basically one of the ways that's really a perfect inroads for us in terms of action projects are that they are projects. And so project-based learning is just this perfect conduit for us. And so that's sort of where we live in a lot of the work that we do with schools, meaning um, students and teachers. And so, um, Car, could you give me the next slide? Um, so basically we do, we support students and teachers uh, in a variety of ways and platforms in a bunch of different projects. Um, one, one, one way that we do that is through the Energy Action Project Institute. And so I'm just gonna share with you some of the projects that students and teachers have worked on with us. Um, so in the transportation sector, we have supported schools doing, um, doing pedestrian retrofits. And so that's that photo on the right hand side for in order for students to be able to, bike, to walk and bike safely in their community. Um, and then supporting events, um, electric school bus planning in schools for retrofits and also to help the integration of some of these pilots as well as some idle free projects. Um, some other projects that we've worked on in the past with some students and teachers were investigating their schools. So using infrared cameras to, and just general observations to see what's going on with heat in their school. And then actually being able to um, sleuth out where where there's issues in the building and um, some of these students have actually been able to make recommendations for retrofits to their buildings folks about insulation um, and whatnot and uh, yeah so some pretty great projects um, and um, car you can go to the next slide um, and then in the sector of concert of electricity and electrical conservation uh, projects around um, plug loads and lighting. Um, and so again, investigating schools and figuring out how we're using electricity and lighting um, or lighting for like electricity for lighting and then figuring out what uh, what kids want to change in their schools around that. And so, um, so basically most of these projects are, um, are, they're, they're on the range of either student or teacher driven, depending on sort of who's coming to us. Sometimes an individual student will be, will specialize, especially with personalized learning plans, will be coming to us with a specific interest. And so we support those individual students, but we'll also support a teacher who might have a class um, or a group of students who start a green team. Um, and so, yeah, so sort of what this looks like can vary. Um, and so right now we are still available to support students in projects of their choosing. And so a lot of the a lot of the things that we've developed for home learning involve opportunities for students to, like Kara said, investigate their homes um, and think about ways that they can change energy in their homes and then we're available for consultation. So, um, so that's sort of ongoing. So the projects aren't based off of schools necessarily, um, but we're still here uh, and so we can, show how to use tools, but uh, that's the other thing too. We have a bunch of tools that are available to students. And um, real quick, because I know I don't have much time left. Um, the other big way that we support action projects is with Youth Climate Leaders Academy. And, um, and Matt, who's going to talk next, has actually been involved with this with us for the last three years that we've been going. And so, um, it is a program for high school students in which we, we create a format 
to support students as they gain skills and do projects around climate. And these are completely whatever project makes sense. Um, actually, Beck, who is going to be on with us later, uh, came to the retreat this last year. And um, third year running, we had we have about 70 -ish students um, engaged in the program this year. And um, projects range pretty broadly, um, anywhere under the climate umbrella for this program and anything from um, working on changing a parking lot into a food forest to getting involved with school retrofits and, um, and actually reconstruction of schools and making sure that uh, the green building measures are being taken. So that's two different students are working on projects like that. Um, another project so when, yeah we have some lighting audits going on um at least we did before we moved away from schools um for the rest of the year and some other projects a lot of quite a few district or actually two district-wide waste reduction projects and so where things are at with a lot of this right now is um we're just trying to figure out as we all are which of these things we transition and change um and um in terms of changing you know how we it doesn't mean that something like an energy committee isn't meeting it means that we just need to make sure that we email to find out when they're meeting and that we're meeting virtually and so a lot of that is going on so these projects are still still moving but moving slowly and in different ways as we all are um, and the other thing is um, uh, something I'm excited about is that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this that we are hoping to be able to use as a platform to think about um, to think about change and transformation in um, in the way that we do things. And so, uh, Car, you can move to the last slide. Um, and so, yeah, just a tiny, tiny bit, just more about the program because hopefully we'll be. Um, we'll be back at it next year um, and we do a retreat where there is a bunch of skill building so this is coming all together so we have to wait till time for us till we, we can come all together and it um, might be a little while but um, skills workshops where students are learning skills that um, that are either shared from student to student or from somebody in the community that help with a broad variety of climate projects that students are about to embark upon, um, as well as consultations with community partners and specialists in whatever field students are interested in doing projects in. Um, and so that's our two days and then, um, and then we go off and do our work. Um, so uh, that's sort of the super quick and dirty, um, sorry I took a tad bit more time than we were allotted. <laughs> and so I think I'll um, pass it back to Car if you have anything to add. And if not, then we can move on to Matt. Uh, no, we'd just love to be a resource um, if folks know teachers who are looking for this sort of work. And we'll look forward to answering any questions that might arise in a, a little bit. So we're going to go uh, transition quickly here to Matt Henshin. Uh, Matt is a friend, a, a great teacher at Harwood Union High School. I had a chance to work with Matt a lot when, when I was teaching at Winooski High School. He was, he and his students at Harwood were the, uh, the core group that started up the Youth Lobby Network in Vermont and hosted a series of, uh, of, of uh, student rallies at the State House uh, and uh, strongly involved in the Climate Congress that that I have to say really impressed the legislature this year when they came through with their resolution. And uh, so Matt, uh, when, when you are ready, go ahead and mount your slides up. Take the screen here. Yeah. Great. And take it away. All right. Well, um, so I just wanted to share so I, I, I'm sort of involved in climate education in three ways. Um, one is in teaching. Um, the second is as a mentor to the youth lobby. And then the third is, um, you know, trying to do my best to sort of spread the word and, and get involved in more professional development, professional learning communities and that sort of thing. So the first thing um, that I do is I, I teach, I'm a history teacher, social studies teacher at Harvard Union High School. And 
about, I think seven years ago, I was given the opportunity to teach a course called Creating Sustainable Communities. It's a sophomore civics class at Harwood. Um, and it was founded uh, in response to the sustainability standards that were created in 2001 in Vermont. And I think we were the first state to have sustainability standards. Um, and this class was um, in response to that. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a unique class because in sustainability education, there's three main spheres you look at. You look at economic issues, environmental issues, um, and then issues of social justice. And I would be teaching those regardless of the class, but it really, it, it was a really great um, inroads into um, climate change. And I think um, one of the things that motivated me the most, when I, the, the very first year I started teaching um, environmental issues and climate change, I came across a short film by 350 Vermont, or actually 350.org, um, that Bill McKibben helped put together called Do the Math. And that's one of the critical resources. And Bill McKibben talks about how very important it is um, to, to build and be part of a movement, a larger movement. And, you know, we've been doing outstanding work in Vermont at the local level, at the school level. Um, we've been making, you know, Veep um, has really led the way in that. I mean, we're talking about, you know, massive um, energy savings, massive cost savings. It's been huge. But as you guys all know, um, you know, individual change uh, is not going to be enough. If we're going to deal with a problem as big as climate change, we need change, you know, from the individual level, the school level, and also a much broader social level. Um, so to build a movement, to contribute to a movement that would actually put pressure on lawmakers to pass public policies that would um, kickstart, fast forward the changes that we need, um, that, that really... Um, called out to me. And when Bill McKibben in that film said, you know, these, you know, our institutions um, are not working the way they should. And when, it, when society's institutions aren't working the way they are, it's up to us to do things that would make us be a little more uncomfortable to, to sort of do things we wouldn't normally do. And it kind of, it gave me the, the push to try to do some things that are a little more creative um, and a little more, I don't know, a little, little kind of pushing the envelope as far as what you can do in a class. Um, so this class, Creating Sustainable Communities, the climate, edu the climate unit is actually one of the very last units. It's, all, it's very frustrating because I'm trying to make it happen before the climate rally in April or, or May, but there's a lot students need to know to understand because we don't just do like, this is a civics class, so we're not, we do a quick review of, this, of the science, um, but we study public policy and then we study um, political literacy, um, political ideology, economic ideology, we look at social issues of social justice, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, and then we, we start looking at media literacy. So by the time we get the climate unit, they've started to build, I guess what I would call a political literacy and media literacy. They can understand um, why we do what we do. So towards the end of the year, we do the climate unit. <clears throat> we, briefly, we briefly review the science. Um, and I find that I have to do that less and less at Harwood a few you know, years ago it wasn't really being taught that well. Um, now it is. So it's a quick review of the science. We explore the numbers and what that actually means. So what is the world at 1.5 degrees going to look like? What is it going to look like at two degrees? We try to create some real clarity over what are we talking about um, and try to teach the students to read beyond the headlines. Um, and the focus of our work, we, you know, we, of course, we, we, we talk briefly about individual changes and individual um, things that things that they can do individually, but we don't focus too much on that. We focus more on public policy, collective action, um, and the big the big question we ask is why are we not taking stronger action to address climate change? That's that's the question. When you when you look at the science, you look at the numbers, you look at what's going on. The question is why why are we not, not taking greater action? And that kind of that pretty much drives the unit. So after looking at uh, the issue through do the math. Um, sometimes we'll watch before the flood, although that's been taken, I think they're watching that in science now. But the, the, the key films for us, or the key resources are Do the Math and then Merchants of Doubt. Uh, Merchants of Doubt really looks at that question, why are we not taking stronger action? And it identifies the opponents that we have in this struggle. It's important to recognize that it's not just a bunch of people you know, dragging their feet, that we have uh, some extremely powerful people 
who do not want to address climate change with, this, with the same sense of urgency that we might want to. And they, and they, they deploy a series of tools and, and, and weapons and manipulations. And we, um, as a movement, have to figure out how to, how to push back against that. So Merchants of Doubt is a very, um, very, very important film. And it does a great job at doing what I really struggled to do before that film, which is to help students uh, kind of answer that question, why are, why are we not doing more? And as part of that, we get into lobbying. We get into the power of the corporate lobby. And so years ago, I had a student, you know, we were talking about lobbying and, and she asked the question, does the youth have a lobby? And I said, that's a great question. There's gotta be somebody that's advocating for, for youth related issues. But sure enough, there was really nothing out there. So we, um, for her project, she, um, she started this website called the Vermont Youth Lobby. And the first year it was really nothing more than a website. And the second year, um, we tried to, we went to different conferences and tried to get people involved. And the third year, um, we decided to do something big. I had been doing a lot of reading about change and systems change. And we decided to try to make caring about the climate kind of the cool thing to do. Um, so we, we, we started, um, we had this just crazy idea to have a, a political rally, which, you know, you know, Bill McKibben asked us to be uncomfortable. That was a very uncomfortable thing for a civics teacher to do, to bring, uh, you know, over the first year of 700 students, but our highest number was 1,500 students um, on school buses to the state house um, to engage in a, a form of political action. Um, we've had four rallies, over 3,500 students from 60 schools. Um, and quite frankly, I, I know at Harwood, it's definitely changed the tone in the tenor. You, you will not find a student at Harwood that doesn't take climate change seriously. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting event. Students, however, learned that that's not enough, that they also need to get much more involved. So they've done opening day press conferences. They've done youth lobby days throughout the session. Um, they've called and, and met with legislators. They've done a whole number of, uh, a whole large number of political action. Um, and then this last year, we kind of culminated with the Youth Climate Congress, where we had 160 students take over the state house and, and actually physically show lawmakers what we wanted them to do when the legislature came into session. Um, and we declared uh, a climate emergency and we came up with over 30 uh, public policy ideas that we would like them to consider. Um, and it, it was, it was very well received. Um, and, you know, this was the year, this was going to be the year we were, we were billing the, the rally as being the, the year where we thank lawmakers for taking bold and decisive action. And um, the coronavirus has kind of changed that a little bit. Um, so started in a class as a student project and, and has grown over the years. We're now considering um, hiring somebody to be an organizer and trying to grow the movement. Um, uh, and then the last thing I do is just trying to get involved in professional development. I've worked um, very closely with Steve Crowley and Tom Sabo. They've, we've been working since day one with the youth lobby, um, the three of us. Uh, Katie Antos Ketchum, Jillian Joyce has been um, really great from Burn Burton. Um, so we're building a, a group of teachers throughout the state um, who want to teach students how to um, discover their power, but also to do something to address climate change. So Tom and I had started a PLC last year and we're hoping, I think, to, to continue it next, um, well, possibly this year digitally and then next year as well. We're also considering a graduate course this summer. So that is what I've been up to now. You know, we have one more person here who's a student at UVM, um, Quinn DeFalco. I think I saw you, are you still with us, Quinn? Maybe not. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, great, there you are, Quinn. I'm looking around my screen. Great. Well, well, Quinn is a uh, UVM student who is involved with the Sunrise Group in Burlington, and she. Uh, it's great to have her here. And Quinn, I'm just wondering if you could share with everybody what Sunrise is up to. And I know you've got a few things, and it's shifted. I know you were involved in the divestment work and 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 pressuring uh, Senator Leahy and things. What, what are you folks doing now? Yeah, so um, this year has had, uh, we've been working on a couple different projects. The major ones earlier in the year um, were of, at the beginning of, uh, we kind of run like 
on, you know, on a school year, but so there was like the big September um, strike that we helped mobilize a lot of people on the UVM side of things because a lot of our leadership is um, up on the UVM campus. And since then we've been trying to grow our hub into the community. And um, we had in um, December um, a candlelight vigil um, to sort of have a space for people to share their stories um, and invited a couple of like the middle school um, members of our group from town to share sort of like their hopes for what they want to see in a future where climate action is taken and this was done in tandem with um, getting a group of our youth members to approach uh, Senator Leahy's office and um, offer him a um, sort of an agreement that he would sign on to the Green New Deal, which um, he refused. And um, after that, we have sort of, our Earth Day goals are sort of to follow up, putting um, more pressure on our legislators. But before um, we started building that, we had two sort of um, unrelated, but um, related actions, one directly targeting UVM, pressuring the board of press seat, uh, sorry, the board of trustees to um, divest. Um, they have uh, several of the board members um, have a lot, quite a bit of money invested in um, directly in or in companies related to the fossil fuel industry. And um, along with several other American universities, we are um, trying to, along with the divestment movement on campus, um, putting pressure on them to divest and to use our school money um, for the green infrastructure that is so um, advertised um, on UVM campus. And then we um, had a series of interviews with local politicians um, for Burlington City Council, trying to, um, we, so we sort of had an endorsement process to try and help our hub members and the general community to get on informed about what the different platforms um, specifically related to climate that the different um, city council members were like where they stood um, and we hosted debate viewing parties and basically um, a lot of our actions for Earth they were kind of disrupted and so today we, we just put out a video with different um, uh, group members sort of speaking to what Earth Day is um, for them but all, all of our actions were sort of focused around forming critical mass, which is a bit hard to do right now. So we're trying to figure out right now how to reorient in sort of an educational direction and to figure out how we can keep um, momentum going, putting pressure on both local and um, international legislation. So, yeah. Oh, great. Thanks so much. No problem. I have to say that uh, the, the uh, sunrise meetings, I've been to two or three of them and, and, uh, they, they do hold them in the community. They hold them down at the Fletcher Library in Burlington. And uh, they're remarkably efficient meetings. Uh, they, they are, they're in and out in an hour and, and you guys uh, have some amazing accomplishments each time I've been there. So, so great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Beck, did you get your? your yeah, I, th oh, I think great. I'm working out. Yep. All right, great. cool. Thanks. Yeah, so I was one of Matt's students uh, a few years ago, and he kind of got me involved in the youth lobby, which was really a, uh, a turning point for me. I, I've always cared about the environment and everything, but uh, that was when I really got involved politically. And uh, since then, I've joined Extinction Rebellion Youth and done a lot of work legislatively, doing research and talking to the legislators to uh, try and further the movement. Great, great. So maybe, maybe uh, you know, when questions pop up, we, you'll be able to add some of that perspective. There's one other person Absolutely. that I want to uh, call on right now, and that's Lauren Traster. Lauren does uh, work with the 4-H and Extension at UVM, and has uh, a lot of done a lot of work in the energy realm. Had uh, numerous uh, major events at UVM for high school students and others. And I will mention that. Uh, Lauren shared some of her uh, work with me and I've placed it at the bottom of the resource document, which I tried to email to everybody just before this started. 
but if you didn't get that in the email, you'd see over in, in the chat uh, box on the right, uh, there is a, a URL there for a Google Doc that is a resource document. And Lauren's stuff is at the bottom of that page. So Lauren, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. It's always good to be reminded of all the great work that happens. Um, so yeah, so um, I work with the 4-H program, which is part of UVM Extension, and have been running a lot of youth programs for many years now. Um, very similar to all of you, I've been pivoting as fast as I can to get into a virtual platform. And we do have some upcoming programs that would be of interest um, to the youth of Vermont. And we actually have been opening our programs to any youth all across the country. So we have been having um, youth from New England states and as far as California and Arizona and Texas. Um, and they're learning about stuff that's happening here in Vermont and then hopefully bringing some of those ideas back to their own states. But coming up, some of the programs we have, um, we do virtual science cafes and we have several that are coming up um, over the next several weeks that all have environmental themes to them. So there is, um, well, next week we have one on pandemic. So that's related to everything going on right now, but we have one on plant biology and one on how you, um, we have some grad students who are gonna be sharing their research on how people develop their environmental values. And the one I'm most excited about that just got posted today, I have a friend who is a wildlife veterinarian who has done extensive work with uh, mountain gorillas and is gonna be doing a cafe at the end of May on his work. Um, and so it, it's covering a lot of topics. But we do another program called um, Teen Time, Quarantine Time, where we're, um, we just finished a three part series with VSAC on getting career and college ready. But now we're moving into different topics and we have one on May 5th where I'll be talking about two of my programs, the Youth Environmental Summit and the Teens Reaching Youth for the Environment program. Mariah is going to be coming to talk about the Youth um, Climate Leaders Academy. And we have um, folks from the Cultivating um, Pathways to Sustainability. So we're going to be sharing those four programs so um, Vermont youth can understand what each program is about and to really see how they connect to one each other to one another so that it's not do one and not the other, but that they all connect um, and, and really can create this nice pathway of learning within each program. So with that, um, my hope is also to have the Youth Environmental Summit again in November. I'm hoping for an in-person, um, but I have plans to move it virtual if need be. Um, and then the Try for the Environment program where we train um, middle and high school students to teach environmental lessons to younger students. Hopefully we got our knee uh, chopped off at the knees this year. Kids were in the middle of their teaching lessons when school got closed and they couldn't finish their lessons. So hopefully we can get the program back up and going next year. Um, but that's a neat program. We've trained over 500 teens in the last six, seven years, and they've taught about 4,500 um, elementary school students in those years. So it's a, it's a really vibrant program, and Veep is one of our partners in that. And I'll, I'll put the Great. website in the chat so people can go look at the programs. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. So, so that gets us to the place where we kind of want to open things up. Uh, if, uh, if people have questions, um, you could either uh, type your question into the chat box or just say, I have a question or a comment and, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to get to everybody. Uh, so, but I, I, what, I'd, what I'd like to start off with is, is just in general, uh, uh, I'm wondering if, if any of you folks have ideas of how um, how you feel about relating this, the schoolwork you're doing, whether it's in school or at home, to uh, what's happening in Montpelier with legislation. And, and you know, it was a big push this year to get a lot of great bills passed. And I'm curious if any of you feel like uh, that was on, on track to be successful 
or how you feel about that. Were you part of that deck? Were you part of that effort? Yeah, yeah, it was. So I did a lot of the research for the youth lobby and writing a lot of the like um, summaries of the bills to make it accessible to people so you didn't re have to read through a big, long, long form bill to understand what's being talked about in Montpelier. And uh, that that's still happening. You know, we can still track that even if it's, you know, slowed down in Montpelier. But uh, that's a lot of what I did for the youth lobby. And uh, for Extinction Rebellion, I also... Um, I've been working on a couple of things. First of all, the uh, uh, executive order that we passed off to Governor Scott. We haven't gotten any response. You know, he's too busy for us. But uh, basically saying, you know, declare a climate emergency, acknowledge the science for what it really is, and uh, commit yourself to supporting the legislation that will seek to further those goals. So that's what I've really been involved with, with all that. I think I've seen some of what you wrote. It was great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Great. Any anybody else have any questions or comments? Uh, Rebecca has posted a comment. Do you want to go ahead and and uh, share that with us, Rebecca? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Can I? Let's see. Hey, Steve, she says her, her mic is not working. So. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll just read what you wrote here, Rebecca. I'd love to know more about the home energy audits for kids. I'm a science teacher in Tahoe, so not in Vermont. Well, welcome from Tahoe. Uh, but are there online resources that you could share? I actually teach elementary, but also work with our high school student climate action students. Yeah, so, so um, our... the. It, the resources that we've put together are for anybody. We tried to use things that folks would have in their homes. So if you go to veep.org, um, on the, the front page, you'll see a link highlighting home learning resources, and you can go in there and please feel free to use them. We would love to know how they go for you if you do. Um, I can also add in there that in terms of particular audits, Stuff. We, um, Car and I were just talking about the fact that we're working on, on some, um, on some high school level home audit, audit stuff that's probably going to take a little bit longer. Um, and so the other way to get hold of us just for anybody is on the website. It's info at beef.org. And Rebecca, I don't know if you're, if how much you know about Vermont or Vermont institutions, but, um, Vermont Efficiency is a government um, uh, entity that is, in effect, an uh, energy efficiency utility um, to complement or, uh, the ordinary electric utilities. And Vermont Efficiency might be a good place for you to reach out to. Um, they are very engaged and they do a lot of work where they come into people's homes, look around, tell us what would be the first thing that you might consider doing in this home. And there's a lot of work to be done in Vermont. If you want to introduce your students to a place where home efficiency needs are all over the state, Vermont is just such a state. And there are lots of people here who would support that kind of partnership with you. And just to, um make that connection, uh, VEEP does the uh, education work for efficiency Vermont for school age children. So the, the things that we've put together are probably the majority of what they would have for school age children. Excellent. Great, great. Well, Bob uh, has made a note in the comments, everybody, that uh, he's, he's posted a, a URL linking to a video that he recorded of the Youth Climate Congress, which happened in the fall. So. Uh, is that, uh, Bob, is that the full direct recording or is it edited down? I think it was the full thing. It's like 37 minutes long. So, oh, okay. um, but um, I just remember being so inspired by the work that the kids did that day. I was there the whole thing and um, it was just really impressive. That's all. And I, I just tried to capture it as best I could as an amateur um, vide videographer or whatever. Um, just to capture that day because it was just so incredible. Well, you you underestimate your skills. Uh, 
did you capture the outdoor press conference? I did. Yep. Um, and the, the cheering of the crowd and mm -hmm. the hair went up on my arms. It was really a moving day. It really yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, did, uh, is, is there anybody else who was there who wants to share more about the Climate Congress? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was, I, I was spending some time in the legislature uh, this session and, and there were days where uh, uh, students from the Congress made their way around from committee to committee and many of those committees took their full poster sized uh, uh, versions of the resolution that they adopted and posted it right up in the committee rooms. So that was, that was pretty impressive. So you, uh, what you're no, saying uh, is you, you can move mountains. <laughs> yeah, I also want to add on to the note is on Valentine's Day, the, the youth groups did a really creative idea where they brought a love letter to all the committees about their climate expectations mm -hmm. on Valentine's Day. So it's kind of like you got to be creative in this, cool. this way of getting messaging and competing for ideas. Um, so I thought that was very inspirational the way the students did it. I know I posted a, a link on the, or the Sierra Club website, uh, Facebook page back on it, and I'll try to remember to share it onto here, but I don't have access to that note right now. But hey, someone just idea. said something about moving mountains. I, I, I was also at the, that, the Student Climate Congress Day. It was very inspirational, but I also think that we all are learning so much right at this moment about how big of mountains we can move really, really fast when we have the inspiration to do so. And I'm really curious to explore with students and adults and all of us what we can learn from this whole COVID-19 experience and what how we can bring that into the climate movement. Um, I don't have an answer, just a big, big question. If I could just jump in on that real quick with a, with a thought. Um, the tools that we have available to us right now um, are pretty powerful. And um, so really optimizing their use and using them in a way to get the word out to people and help them understand what, what we're trying to do. So events like this, I'm just totally supportive of and I'll do whatever I can to help. The, um, the other aspect of it is they came up with two point something trillion dollars in what, 72 hours? in a very short period of time. And Bernie was pushing, not to get political, but Bernie was pushing for like um, Medicare for all, or you know, healthcare for all. And it was gonna be a trillion dollars and oh, we could never afford that. That's unbelievable, we could never do that. Uh, if we can come up with $2 trillion, we, you know, we can come up with more <laughs> and put it towards efforts that you know, we really think are important, not bailing out the oil industry, not bailing out the airlines. Um, they both have connections with their banker buddies. They can finance themselves. And if they can't, then they shouldn't be in business. The money should be going towards Green New Deal-like projects, moving us forward, if I do say so myself. So I will, uh, great. I will just mention, I see a number of people have been putting uh, some links some URLs in the chat box there. And um, I guess the, the caution here is that that chat box goes away as soon as our uh, our Zoom conference goes away. So Actually, what I'd ask you, is if that- you, If you press the three dots to the right, at least on a, on a Mac using these, um, I'm using, oh, this is the Zoom software. Click on the three dots and it says save chat. And oh. it should it should save it right to your computer, so you'll have oh, all yeah. of your okay. um, the so, saved links. But having them on the website at some point would be awesome too. Boy, it's great to have you with us, Bob. <laughs> I learn something new every time. Uh, well, it is convenient. But, That's a nice feature. But I, but I will also say that that we have that uh, resource document that we shared with everybody. Uh, there's a link here, but I did I sent it by email as well. And, and uh, we could take some of those URLs and paste them right there. So uh, that way everybody will have that. Uh, let's see, I see a, a, a Daniela, do you wanna share your uh, comment? Can you get yourself uh, off, uh, there we go. 
thank you for letting me participate in this. Um, I know I know Rob Kidd personally, and so that's how I got the invitation. I, I'm a homeschool teacher. Um, I do have dogs here, so I hope there's not too much noise in the background. Um, I'm actually both a parent teaching at home and a homeschool educator. So I sometimes run classes, clubs for homeschool students. So I was definitely interested in a lot of the VEEP ideas um, and wondered if there was anything similar in New Jersey to VEEP that I could access. I mean, the green team idea sounded great. I could see getting together a group of high school homeschoolers who would, you know, a lot of the homeschool kids like to like to participate already in uh, climate activities in our in like and and in local community projects. So I just wondered if there was something similar in New Jersey. I don't know of one in New Jersey. I know that there are similar organizations in a number of states, but not all states. And I don't know of anything in New Jersey, but you're very welcome to use whatever resources we have. And also, we are happy to answer questions. If you, you end up having specific questions, or you're trying to put something together and you want to just chat with someone, we'd be happy to chat. Just I would, I would just sort of build on that and ask if in Vermont or from anywhere else, Kara and Mariah, have you had uh, much interaction with with parents that are working with students who are now either regularly homeschooled or suddenly homeschooled uh we work mostly with teachers that's yeah. normally and so and the resources that we have put together could be used by a parent and their their kids but again it's we designed them more for a teacher to assign and you know have their students mm -hmm. doing that work um so i don't have we, we haven't done as much with homeschools unless it's groups of homeschool students that are functioning more like a classroom. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, anybody else? We do have a few more minutes. We have... somebody just joining us um i'd uh, just like to jump in i i mentioned this before we went uh live and or before it was recorded I, and i just want to remind folks that if these issues are important to you that the sharing the link effectively with people who you think might embrace the ideas that we're sharing here is uh so so critical um each time it gets shared it typically if you share it like on facebook it'll hit about on average about a thousand news feeds now it'll just go through that person's news feed and a lot of you know this but um but the fact that they'll see it and they'll it'll sort of register with them um earth day and and the issues that we're talking about and then some of those thousand people will actually click on it and watch it some of them will get engaged and come back to watch another one. And that's how you help build a movement, getting these things out there. It's one thing to, to post this as a sponsored post. You've seen them coming through your newsfeed. You can tell the difference between that and one that your friend says, hey, you should check this out. This is really interesting. This is really important. When you do that, you're helping build the movement of doing the right thing on this planet and here in Vermont. So actively and effectively using this this resource of a video like this is it's gold i mean it's really really important so i just wanted to express that i mean we've been doing this so long everybody's been using facebook and you know but we if we use it really effectively you can move mountains you can affect change so one at a time just keep plugging away at it and it does add up one of the things um, that I want to just bring back from what you were saying earlier, Bob, um, was that when we perceive something to be an emergency, we act pretty quickly on it. And I think the task for us as educators is to finally get the public to think of this as an emergency. So I think the work that you're doing back in and uh, others here um, to try to move things at the higher political levels to get a recognition that this is really a serious problem because very few people are treating this as a serious problem. 
I'm afraid you're right. And thank you. Um, it is just so important just because the COVID-19 issue is on the front burner as it should be, doesn't mean that the effects on the climate aren't still happening. <laughs> um, and we need to take action. Um, we can chew gum and stick it under our desk at the same time. Um, I never did that, by the way. I never stuck my gum under my desk at school. We know that. Yeah. So um, I, I have a show coming up pretty soon. I, I think it's going to be next week or the week after with Roger Hill, the climatologist. And he's doing a, um, a live Zoom event for me. We're going to actually have a recording of the presentation. And then at the end, he's going to be available live to, to take questions. And with this audience, I think it would be something that you would find interesting. I have two of his other videos um, that I shot uh, live at the Universalist Church in Montpelier. And um, I can can make those available to the Sierra Club to, to share around as well. But um, his presentations are sobering. It's not actually easy to watch the whole thing, to be quite honest with you. I saw people literally crying in the audience at one point. Um, so, but the knowledge is so critical to really have an understanding of the effect of polar ice on our climate. And he um, Roger just explains it so well and makes it easier to, to sort of have that epiphany of, oh, I kind of get this now. It's one thing to, to you know, see a, an ice cap melting and an, it's another to realize the implications of that melting. So um, I'll let Rob know when that's happening and maybe we can cross pollinate with the, uh, with the link so you, you're sure to see it. Um, I'm very excited to do it. Uh, he's He's got some amazing information about that. And, it, and I, there's nothing wrong with kids seeing it either for that matter, so. Also, Alan Betts is doing a Zoom meeting next Tuesday evening, 6.30 to 8. And that's been on the Montpelier Front Porch Forum just one of a couple of nights ago. But I can, uh, Rob, I'll send you the information. You can send it to this group, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, great. And um, actually, Catherine, since seeing you here, Catherine, I didn't even notice that you were here um, at the top there, but uh, we shot a, a video for Catherine in the library with Bill McKibben also. So you could go to the, um, where is that link, Catherine? It's on the library's Facebook page. And which, which library is it? Kellogg Hubbard. Okay, so go to the Kellogg Hubbard's Facebook page, right. and the um, the video just scroll down somewhere in there. It'll the, yeah. he, there's about a thirty minute um, conversation with Bill McKibben. Yeah. That That's was it. interesting. Great. Well, there are a few more things that have been mentioned. I see a little okay. bit in the chat, but we really are are coming to the end of our hour here. And uh, Rob, did you have one more slide you wanted to put up? Uh, but then also, I just want to let everybody know these kind of community conversations we're having with the Vermont Sierra Club. Uh, we, like Steve gave you some of the listing of all the other conversations coming up next uh, week. We have a May Day and a Just Transition, which is about really our labor connections and about how we justly transition. So we're helping all workers and we're helping people across the board across issues. Uh, then on May 6th, uh, Jared Duvall of the Energy Action Network is going to be speaking about their uh, annual energy progress report. Um, so that's going to be a little bit in depth, but we're going to make Jared talk a little bit more, be in more of a conversation like we're trying to do. Uh, May 13th, the future of public transit in Vermont. Uh, you know, we were trying to really push public transit here, but with the, with the, with the coronavirus, a lot of the public transit units have had to reduce their, their routes because less people are riding, they're, even their drivers are are uh, being impacted by that. So we're gonna figure out how we can proceed further. Um, and then uh, some experts from the Vermont Law School and I know uh, former state representative Keisha Rahm um, will be speaking about the, how the pandemic is exposing environmental health disparities. And then on May 27th, the mega dam and mega damage. Uh, a lot of people think hydro uh, is re fully 100% renewable. Uh, there's a lot of falsities around that. So thank you for all for joining this conversation. Um, you know, we, will, we were trying to stream this on, online. Uh, it didn't happen, uh, but we will make this available for those who want it. Uh, I know Bob is gonna uh, rebroadcast some of our shows on his feed. Uh, so, uh, you know, if but anybody wants this, please um, 
let me know and I can share the link of the recording. And uh, so, uh, remember to save the chat box, everybody. It, but we'll also post some of these uh, links right on that resource document. And uh, and so again, uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. It's been a great discussion. Um, great to have people from all the way from New Jersey and and Tahoe and and around Vermont. So um, happy Earth Day, everyone! Fifty year anniversary of Earth Day today. It's great to have you here with us.